Free will, predestination. Excellent question. Wow. I told you, uh, if you're going to give you answers you may not like, you may like them. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my journey. And I don't want to offend any of my brothers and sisters who may not like that I've changed. I used to be a five-point Calvinist. Okay. I used to be. Okay. I don't want to offend anyone who is. I'm no longer a Calvinist. And I believe it's because the weight of Scripture made me change my position. I understand. And I don't want people who are Calvinists to think I'm saying that you're not Christians. I'm saying in my journey, my understanding, I've changed. So when you ask me about predestination and free will, what exactly are you asking me about predestination? Are you asking me, has God predestined everything everyone does within yeah. time and space? Yeah. Are you asking me... Salvation. Salvation, okay. So even that, and I'm not trying to skirt the answer because that question needs a little unpacking. Are you asking me, has God predestined those who will be saved? Yes. And when you ask me that, do you really mean... God has already chosen before creation who will be saved and who won't. In other words, God has created you yes. to be saved through faith in Christ, but He's created him to hand them over to desires of his heart and then damn him accordingly. Is that what you're asking me? Pretty much. All right. If you read the totality of Scripture, right. God truly desires the salvation of every human creature. Right. You can't get around that. See, these were the things that as a Calvinist I struggled with. Right. I struggled with. I'll give you a couple examples. Right. So we can be here all night talking about this. It's up to you guys. Because this is a very, and I'm treading lightly, not because I don't want to answer, but it's not a yes or no. I have to unpack it. Yeah. I've been spending 50 years trying to figure it out. Brother, we're going to be spending thousands of years still trying to figure it out. That's <laughs> You're not, believe me, we're not going to figure it out. But I can tell you with absolute certainty on the basis of Scripture God desires the salvation of even those who end up rejecting Him and going to hell. Right. And from the depth of His being, He desired their salvation. And I'm not saying this because I want to tickle people's ears. If I was in a church, they're all Calvinists, I would say the same thing. Right. Right? And then you'd have those Calvinists who tell you, well, that's the two wills of God. In certain Calvinist understanding, God has two wills. What He decrees, what He has determined, and what He desires. He may desire the salvation of everyone, but he's only decreed the salvation of the elect. They call this the two wills in God. You'll hear some prominent Calvinists mention this, like John Piper. You heard John Piper? Yeah. John MacArthur. Yeah. They talk about the two wills of God. What God desires and what he's decreed. So he desires the salvation of a Judas, but he's decreed the damnation of Judas. And they go, we don't understand how it works. Now, if that's biblical, I'm okay with not understanding how God works. But let me give you some passages that troubled me, that... Jesus, remember I said he's the God of truth. He can't lie. Because he can't lie, he's not play acting. So go to Luke 19, 41 to 44. Now here's where the King James Bible will do you a favor in certain passages. And I'll tell you what I mean in a minute. Luke 19, 41 to 44. Luke 19, 41 to 44. Excellent question. Excellent question. And this is going to be a debate until the Lord comes because we're dealing with an infinite mind and how that infinite mind relates to creation and time. Mm -hmm. You get two Christians, you're going to get 50,000 opinions. Because you're dealing with an infinite mind, right? I mean, imagine you want to take an entire body of water and put it in this cup. Is that going to be possible? Right? So you are that cup and God is that huge ocean. You try to fit them into your brain. It ain't going to happen. His ways are higher than our ways. So it's not that God doesn't want you to understand, even if He wanted you, there are certain things God cannot do. And that's not irreverent. There are certain things God cannot do. He cannot lie, right? He cannot disown Himself, right? He cannot tempt you with evil. So God cannot take a finite creature and make Him infinite. It doesn't happen, right? So even if God wanted you, you, you're a creature. By your very nature, you're limited and you cannot contain the infinite. And even that needs to find it. But anyway, Luke 19, 41 to 44. Luke 19, 41 to 44. Notice the heart of Jesus towards Jerusalem that he's now going to allow to be destroyed by the Romans. Notice his heart. Whoever wants to read it. Luke 19, 41 to 44. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, Jerusalem, and wept over it, saying... He God, wept, huh? Yeah. So now before you move on, you've got to read it slowly so it can simmer. Was he play acting? Were these genuine tears from his heart? Of course you're going to say, because to say he's play acting, that's blasphemy. So here is the human face of God shedding human tears because his heart is broken. But why is his heart broken? Keep reading. 
saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children with thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Now notice two factors here. First he says, if you only knew what made for your peace. So Jesus came to destroy or to grant them peace? Grant them peace, right? And then 44 he says, but you've left me no choice, and the time is coming. Your enemies will embank, make an embankment around you, dash you and children, to the ground and leave not one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. What in the world does that mean? Well, you don't need to guess. Luke has already told you what it means, visitation. Go to Luke 1 and read 67 to 69 and pay attention to verse 68. Luke 1, 67 to 69. What does it mean, the time of your visitation? Luke will explain. This is the beauty of scripture. The author will explain the things he's written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So you don't need to guess. You don't need Sam Shimon's commentary. But if I do write a commentary, I expect every one of you to buy multiple copies. <laughs> now, Luke 1, 67 to 69. Whoever's there, please read. The God of Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. So understand, this is the utterance from the Holy Spirit, right? That's why I had you start at 67. Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit, so it's the Holy Spirit who's moving him to utter these words. These are the words the Holy Spirit is moving Zechariah to utter. It's not his fallible, imperfect opinion. Okay, just keep that in mind. Keep reading. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come and has redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn. A Your translation did not translate. I'll read it. Visited. He has visited his people. Praise be the Lord, God of Israel, for he has visited That's and the word. redeemed his people. What translation are you reading? Um, the NIV. 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 The, the not inspired version. <laughs> also, <laughs> the new, the new <laughs> now uh, NIV, work your way away from the NIV. Okay. I'm being, I'm being honest. Say it again. It's got all my markings. Yeah, that's yeah, but that's the old problem. The one thing a translation is not just a translation is an interpretation. At times, you need to interpret, not just translate, literally. Because if I translate literally, you're going to lose the meaning. But there are times in which the NIV has translated in a way that's more of a paraphrase that was unnecessary. For example, when your translation said, the Lord God has come, you didn't see any connection between what was said there and with what Jesus said. So you lost the connection. Unless you're reading it in the Greek, right? But that's why you want a translation so you don't go to the original languages. Because they need to go to seminary and you know, be in debt up to your eyeballs to learn the languages. So notice his translation. Read it one more time. Luke 168. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. So why did the Lord God visit his people? To do what? Destroy them or redeem them? To redeem them. So when Jesus said, you did not recognize the time of your visitation, what is he referring to? That I am the Lord God who has come to visit you to save you. See the connection? So what was Jesus' desire? To save Jerusalem and all her inhabitants. But because you rejected me, now you've left me no choice but allow you to be destroyed. This is why the wording is important. So what is the time of visitation, Jesus? That God has come to visit His people with salvation, not destruction. So why did you end up destroying them? Because they refused to accept me. So it wasn't your will to destroy them. No, my will was to save every one of them. So why did they end up destroying Because they rejected me. You see where I'm going with this? So free will. We'll get there. So far. Yes. No, so we'll get there. Yeah, no, no. And again, yes. Uh, it, well, I'll explain how the Bible works. It just, you remember, like I said, the, the question he asked me, I can't answer in one minute. I can't answer. If you really want me to do justice to this question, i got to unfold it. Right? In fact, it would even take series of lessons, not just one or two. I'm going to do my best with the four and a half hours allotted to me. Okay. <laughs> anyway, now, that was 168, but now go to 169. Read in your translation. Continue 169. And he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Horn is a metaphor in the Bible referring to a king with sovereign power. He's raised up a king from whose house? David. To do what? Salvation. 
Who is that king from the house of David that's come to save? Jesus. That's why I go to read Luke 2.11 to see it's Jesus. They don't stop texting. <laughs> but anyway, it happens. Luke 2, when you're on social media, you won't get the yeah, But Luke 2.11. Who is the horn, the king from the house of David that comes to save, not destroy? Comes to save, not condemn. Luke 2.11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So God sent His Son... To be born of the seed of David to destroy Jerusalem or to save it? Save salvation. Do you see why Jesus was crying now? Do you see his heart? He started weeping. Because I had come to save you, but because you didn't recognize who I am, but oppose me, you leave me no choice, but give you what you deserve. So this is the heart of God. This is God's heart for even those who are destroyed. His heart was, I didn't come to destroy you, I came to save you. So the Lord did everything in His power and goodness to convince them. They persisted in their rebellion, leaving Him no choice but to hand them over, justifiably so, to destruction. But to make it even more plainer that He came to save them, that was His desire. Same chapter Luke, Luke chapter 1, verses 76 to 77. Read what it says there. Now, Zechariah is prophesying over his son John the Baptist. Because John the Baptist is born, the forerunner of Jesus. So now he's going to prophesy over his son, John. You, John, my son, you were created for this purpose. For what purpose? Read. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, and the forgiveness of their sins. So what is he going to tell the people? The Savior has come, and He's come to save you from your sins by believing in Him. And who's the Savior? Jesus Christ. So it's quite clear in the context of Luke, the intention and the purpose of Jesus was to save Jerusalem as a whole. Everyone, even those that end up getting destroyed. Now let me shock you a little further. Jesus also came to save Judas. Now some of you are shocked. Good, because a lot of people get shocked. What? Yeah. Okay, let me show you what Jesus says to Judas. You who follow me will sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Does that include Judas? Okay. But Jesus knew Judas would betray him, and Jesus, Jesus knew that Judas would be destroyed. However, though Jesus knew it, Jesus is showing his intention and his heart. My heart for you, Judas, is salvation, not destruction. And I have all this in store for you, if you only believe. Let me give you a couple more. Go to Matthew 10, verses 1 all the way to 8. Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. I want you to see, not only was Judas promised a throne, Judas was given the same power to do the same miracles that the others did. Judas, like the rest, raised the dead. Judas, like the rest, gave sight to the blind. Judas, like the rest, cast out demons. Judas, like the rest, preached the gospel and got people saved. It's right there, Matthew 10, verses 1 to 8. You'll see it. And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Eleven of disciples? No, all twelve. Judas too? Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Keep going. To cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother. James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew the tax collector. James the son of... Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So even Judas, huh? Yeah. And so what did Judas do? Keep reading, all the way to eight. These twelve, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand, Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopards, Wait, cast out Wait, Judas demons. is going to, you're reading like, you're, you're really fast, like yeah. you want to get raptured and leave us behind. Don't worry about it. No, <laughs> There's a rapture all going together for saved, so no rush. <laughs> Slowly. What is Judas going to do? Heal what? Heal the sick, raise the dead. So Judas was going to raise the dead. Yeah. Someone whom the Lord knew would betray him would belong to the devil. Keep reading. Cleanse leopards, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without paying. Hmm. So, Judas was given the same authority to do the same miracles 
and was given the same promise to reign over Israel that the rest were, right? It's going to get a little better or worse depending on your theological belief. Go to Luke 10, 17 to 20. Jesus. 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your Now, does that include Judas or no? That would include Judas, right? All right, keep going. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to tread over serpents and scorpions and on all and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Okay, whose names are written in heaven? Whose names are written in heaven? Well, the, 72? the 72 that went out. Okay. Judas went out, went out too? Yes, sir. So his name is written in heaven? I never thought of it before. Exactly. I mean, and I say that because clearly Jesus is showing his intention for Judas. You will sit on one of the 12 thrones. I've given you power over demons. They are subject to you. And your name is written in heaven. See, in the Bible, names are erased. In other words... If you read the Bible contextually, which I'm about to do, every human creature that exists, his name is written. It's when a person falls away that the names are erased. Go to Revelation 3, verse 5. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book. That's a promise to who? The one who conquers, right? So if you conquer, not only will you be given a right role, but I won't blot out your name. Right. Therefore, if you fail to conquer, what happens? You don't need to guess. Go to Exodus 32, 32 to 33, where God makes it explicit. Exodus 32, 32 to 33. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which yeah. thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. So you caught it? He blots out those who sin and turn away. So if I read contextually, Judas' name is in the book. Judas is one of those who will sit on one of the twelve thrones. And Judas is given power to cast out demons, raise the dead, all of which displays Jesus' genuine love for Judas. But it's going to get even more explicit in Luke 22, 19 and 23. Luke 22, 19 and 23. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Now, before you move on, does he exclude anyone in what he just said? Mm -hmm. This bread is my body broken for you. Does he say some of you, most of you, but not all of you? All and then in verse 20, one more time. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Some of you, most of you, but not all of you. Not all of you. But now notice who's included. Now read 21 to 23. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth, as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. So when Jesus said, this bread represents my body broken for all of you. And this cup is the new cup of my blood shed for you. Was Judas there? Of course not. And he included Judas in that saying? So Jesus saying to Judas, I'm even dying for you, and this is how you repay me. Now one more final passage on this. Psalm 69, 27 to 28. Psalm 69, 27 to 28. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be in rolled among the righteous. So there you go. It's blotting out those whose names are in. And why are they being blotted out? Why are the names being blotted out? They're not considered. Because of their right. persistent rebellion and rejecting the truth, right? So why did I bring up Judas? Because Judas represents Jesus' heart for all of Jerusalem. And not just for all of Jerusalem, but all creation. That God's desire is to save every creature that He's created. And God has done everything to show his love for every creature. But when someone persists in rebellion and turns away, then God is justified in handing them over to destruction. So when I used to be a Calvinist, I used to believe, this was my teaching, what I was taught, because there are varieties of Calvinism. 
you have some Calvinists who are four-point four Calvinists, and then you have those Calvinists who believe there are two wills in God. I was one of those taught that Jesus only died for the elect, no more, no less. That's all he died for. And he came to save only the elect, no more, no less. And the elect will then be regenerated by the Spirit and enabled to believe in Christ so that those whom Jesus dies for will be saved because they'll definitely turn to Christ. This is what I was taught. It's these passages that made me start questioning first limited atonement. Then it started making me question what we call irresistible grace. And then it started making me question. See, I was told that if you reject one link, it's inevitable you're going to reject all of them. I didn't think so. I said, I'll be okay. I can reject limited atonement. I'll still believe. But the more I started thinking about it, I go, yeah, they're right. When one goes, they all go. Now, this is my journey. This may not be your journey. This is my journey. But when they keep talking, because I've already, I used to argue these arguments. I already know where they're coming from. I know about Acts 1 and Matthias. I know they're going to say, well, Jesus had Matthias in mind. What Jesus had in mind and what his audience understood, it's two different things. And you can't reject the contextual meaning, what Jesus is conveying to those people on the basis of the missions of Christ. Because then we can play that game all day, all night with many passages of the Bible. Many. One classic text that I use as as a ground to see if people are thinking exegetically or eisegetically, I have them explain to me John 3, 5. And I want to give this as an example because I know where the brothers were coming from. And I was trying to address it without trying to be argumentative, but sometimes you can't avoid it. You have to argue, but that's okay. Sharpen, iron sharpens iron. Now in John 3, 5, this will be a test of our ability to think exegetically or eisegetically, where we impose a tradition onto the text or let the text speak clearly in its historical contextual context. You have to first understand what a passage means in its own context and see how it applies later on. You have to do this, otherwise you're making the Bible fit your theology as opposed to changing your theology degree at the Bible. And we're all guilty of that to some extent. I'm guilty of it. When I say the prayer should be, Holy Spirit sanctify me, show me where I'm wrong. Right? Because I don't think there's anyone on this side of glory that understands the Bible perfectly and is not reading the Bible eisegetically in some extent. We all do it to some extent. Sadly, we're not aware of it. Because if we were, we wouldn't do it, right? <laughs> right? If I knew I'm eisegeting it, you think I want to eisegete it unless I'm of the devil. Because that's what Satan does. He eisegetes. And he does it knowingly and willfully. Okay, so this is going to be a test how you read the Bible, if you read it fairly, historically, contextually, to see what these words meant to the people that Jesus is talking to, and don't brush it aside to omniscience, that's not going to work. Because Jesus is trying to communicate clearly to the people hearing Him. And then we see how it applies to us later on. John 3, 5, after Nicodemus is baffled when Jesus says, you must be born again, he says, truly, truly, I say to you, in verse 5, what does it say? Who wants to read it? Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This will be a test of whether you eisegete or you exegete. What does it mean, water and spirit? Now, I can give you the interpretations given historically. Here, water means the water of the Word. Then when you hear the Word, it cleanses you. And some will go to John 15, verse 3. You're already clean because of the Word I've spoken to you. Or in Ephesians 5, 26. The washing of the water of the Word. Ephesians 5, 26. Okay, that's one interpretation. The other interpretation is that it's referring to natural birth, the water of the womb. Why? Because in verse 4, what does he say? Must I enter my mother's womb a second time? So he understood it to mean natural birth. But then in verse 6, Jesus says, flesh gives birth to flesh, right? Spirit. So, oh, see, natural birth. Okay, that's the second meaning. The third meaning is that when it says water and spirit, that word and gets a little tricky in the Greek. And get any commentary to confirm this. The word and doesn't always mean and. It can mean even. The water, even the spirit, meaning the water, that is the spirit. So that water here means the spirit. It's simply two ways of speaking of being born of the spirit. Now where do they get that from? Because in John 7, 38 to 39, in John 7, 38 to 39, Jesus says, whoever believes in me, as the scripture says, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And then 39, John says, of this he spake of the Spirit. So you see water, that is the Spirit. Now there's a fourth interpretation. Water, baptism, and the Holy Spirit. Those are the four interpretations. Contextually, 
What interpretation makes sense of the context historically? If you tell me water here means being cleansed by the word, you'd have to show me Nicodemus understood it because Jesus is trying to make it clear to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Don't pass it off on God's omniscience because Jesus is trying to tell him, this is what you must do. To then not explain how to do it means he's left in the dark about how to be born again. So would he have understood it to mean the water of the word? How? Jesus never mentioned anything about the word cleansing you. Right? Okay. The strongest, the se I would say the second strong is natural birth. Why? Because before and after he talks about birth, right? Okay, but I'm going to show you one that's even stronger. And this is the unanimous interpretation of the early church, by the way. Let me shock some of you. If you go and read the writings of the church fathers, don't take my word for it. Please do not take my word for it. Do not. Thank God for Chef Google. Google, the greatest scholar who's ever existed. Google.com will get all the answers on Google. The greatest living scholar of the 21st century. You type in John 3, 5, early church fathers. You will find from the epistle of Barnabas to Irenaeus to Justin Martyr and on and on it goes. Every one of them, when they spoke about John 3, 5, they understood water to mean water baptism without exception. And I'm going to tell you why that's important in a minute. I'll tell you that why it's important in a minute. But let's go contextually. How many of you are aware that Jesus used to baptize people in water before his death and resurrection? How many of you are aware that Jesus actually had his disciples immerse people in water, in a body of water. Right. Where do we find that? Childhood. Right here, right after he finishes telling Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit. Because notice in verse 22, after he finishes the conversation, what does Jesus do? Chapter 7 or 8? No, John 3, 22. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, after. Right after he says, you must be born of water and spirit, the only gospel writer to mention... Jesus started baptizing people in water. Coincidence? John 3, 22. Someone read it for me. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea, and there he carried with them and baptized. He baptized, huh? And just so you don't have any doubt it's water, they go to John the Baptist. If you continue reading, they go to John, hey, the man that you're talking about, everyone's going to him to be baptized. And that's when John says, well, I'm just a friend. He is the bridegroom. He must increase. I must decrease. And then if you still don't get that Jesus is baptizing people. Read 26. 26. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to him thou bearest witness. Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And if they're talking to John who's baptizing in water, guess what kind of baptism Jesus is doing? In water. Water baptism. And if you still don't get it, John 4 verses 1 and 2. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples. Through the agency of the disciples. So, is it a coincidence after telling Nicodemus, you must be born of water and spirit, he starts baptizing people in water through the agency of his disciples? Or is John, the author, wants you to make a connection and see Jesus' meaning? See, if you are stuck to a tradition, you're going to read it eisegetically. You know, it can't mean water baptism because my tradition says water baptism doesn't regenerate. Well, that's good for your tradition. I'm dealing with exegesis. My allegiance isn't to your tradition. It's to interpreting the Bible correctly. So convince me exegetically that it's not water baptism. Historically, contextually, exegetically. I agree with you, but I've heard people say, well, what about the thief that was on the, Christ, on the cross, and he says, today sure. you will be with me in paradise. I actually did a session because, let's think logically. Do you really expect someone who's got spikes in his hands to then someone say, hey, get him off right now and dip him in water, dude, or he's not going to heaven? That's right. Exactly. That is one of the worst examples here because Jesus Christ, who's God, can grant anyone salvation any manner he, he sees fit. You're talking about an exceptional case. Someone who not only didn't get baptized, who didn't even go to church, who didn't study the Bible, who didn't take communion. So is he the norm? Is that the person we look to as the normal way of doing things? Or is that an exception to show you that the grace of God is so vast that he can even save you in the last seconds of your life? But ask me a better question. What if that man survived? Would he have then been obligated to get baptized? 
Based on what you're showing us, yes. It has to be, because what did the Lord say? The Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So when he had been a good Christian and good standing, if he survived the, the, the crucifixion and went on his merry way and didn't get baptized. See, this is another thing. We take what are exceptions to the norm and ignore, ignore the normal way of doing things. I, and I can, like I said, I can do this with any example. Hebrews 9.27, we're told, it is appointed for men to die once. And after that comes a judgment. But then Hebrews 11.5 says, Enoch didn't die. Well, hold on, Hebrews. You told me it's appointed for men to die once. Enoch didn't die. Lazarus died, was raised to die again. That's twice. So come on, get your facts straight, Hebrews. You, you with me there? You don't look at the exceptions and then derive your doctrine. You look at the norm. The normal pattern of how God deals with people. And that's how you derive your doctrine. Because if we go with exceptions... I can do that with essentially every doctrine that you take for granted. I can look to those scanty references out of context in isolation and disprove many things you believe. I can do that with the deity of Christ. I can do that with the Trinity. I, I mean, I, we, there's no stopping this method. This is why I said John 3, 5 will be a test study of whether you exegete or you eisegete. But someone had their hand raised? Yeah, I, so, so uh, Matthew 7, 21... Uh, Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, yes. shall I enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father is in heaven. Yes, precisely. He was referring to Judas, one as one. Yes, because Judas yes. did miracles, right. Judas cast out demons, right? right? He did everything right. Jesus said those people would do, but one thing Judas did not do, he did not obey the commands of the Lord. And how does it apply to today, so far as yeah. the you, you can have people who can preach like me. Right. Now, I don't raise the dead yet, I don't know, but maybe we can... Try, maybe someone, you want, you want to be, maybe you drop that. <laughs> I can be preaching all day, all night, but if I'm not striving to live in obedience to the will of God, then I am a Judas. Mm. Because Jesus tells you how you know a true Christian from a false one. It's right there in Matthew 7, 23. I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawless ones. Now the word is interesting. It's anomian. It means without law. A, negation, nomos, meaning you who rejected my law. See, we don't emphasize enough in the church, and we don't. And I, I'm not attacking, I'm just being honest. The necessity to obedience to God's law. Amen. People will tell you, well, Moses gave the law, Jesus gave grace. You know, I'm saved by grace, not by law. Well, that confuses two issues. They weren't saved by law either. In the Old Testament, no one was saved by the law. They were saved by grace. And in the New Testament, though you're saved by grace, you're saved unto obedience to the law of Christ. You have a law that you're supposed to obey. It's called the law of Christ. Go to 1 Corinthians 9, 21. So I didn't mean to go a far drift. I didn't do it justice to the answer about predestination. But I did want to emphasize, however, whatever view you have predestination, you cannot deny God's heart that He wants to save every creature in existence. And I'm going to go back to one more passage to really, you think this is controversial? If I go to this passage, you guys are going to start stoning me. These two brothers are about to headbutt me. When I'm done, they're going to start stoning me. <laughs> Get them out of here, this but, guy, man. Alex, you're, you're disfellowship. But the will of the Father is that everyone would know Him. Therefore, yes. the responsibility according to His will yes. is to go out and tell everyone. Yes, answer. you have to. Yeah. I'll prove that to you, that God's will, because you can't have Jesus' will in conflict with the Father's will, mm. or in conflict with the Spirit then you don't have a trinity. You have three separate gods in conflict. Mm -hmm. The Father's will is in perfect union with the Son's will and the Spirit's will. That's why, if you remember what He said about the Spirit, let me remind you what He said about the Spirit. He will not speak on His own initiative. He will only speak what He hears. That was John 16, 13. The members of the Godhead are in perfect, inseparable union. They always do all things in perfect union. They're never in competition or opposition. So if it's Jesus' will for Judas to be saved, guess whose will that was as well? The Father. The Father and the Spirit. Unless there's a conflict of will within the Godhead. Well, then you destroy the integrity of the Godhead. And I don't think anyone wants to go that far. But let's just read 1 Corinthians 9, 21. 21. wants to read? To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So we do have a law. It's called the law of Christ. And that's in Galatians 6 verse 2, by the way. Galatians 6 verse 2. 
So you Christians have been saved to obedience to the law of Christ. Well, what is that law? That's why I have 27 books of instruction. Galatians 6, verse 2. Hmm. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So Christians, grace doesn't exclude or do away with the law. Grace results in the empowerment to obey the law. The law of Christ. And if you ask me what it is, that's why you have 27 books of instruction. That's the law of Christ. So what's the criterion that Jesus gives there to know a true Christian or a false one? Are you obeying the law? What law? Not the Mosaic law, the law of Christ and his fulfillment of the Mosaic law. Huh? No, I'm, I'm just giving you scripture. Right, are you saying it? So that's the criterion. But now, as far as predestination, and I don't want to keep belaboring it because I want to give people opportunity. Uh, because again, I can be here all day on predestination. This is why I'm trying to know how much to say in a way that will put you on a journey to think more deeply about the, about, about the subject. It, it, you see irrefutable proof God wants every creature to be saved. Now I'm going to show you a passage. I actually debated a colleague of mine, Matt Slick. He's a five-point Calvinist. I love him. He's a dear brother in the Lord. We debate on limited atonements online. Got heated because he's like me. You know, when, you know, when you're a Calvinist and you're Middle Eastern, then you really got issues because then you're super angry, right? No, I'm, just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. But anyway, we, we, it got heated, but it was respectful because I really love Matt Slick. I consider him a brother in the Lord. I know he's not too glad that I left Calvinism. Well, we debated on limited atonement. We debated on the topic. I'll let you watch the debate and you come to your own conclusion. I brought up Colossians 1, and one thing I did not like is how they try to manipulate my exegesis in order to portray me in a very unfavorable light. And that's what often we do. We vilify the other in order to get people not to consider what the person's saying. And that's satanic, by the way. When I vilify you in order to get someone not to listen to you, that means I'm being satanic. Maybe that's not my intention, but it's simply not the way to do things. If someone is a brother in the Lord, you, out of grace, need to give him the benefit of the doubt and see him in the most favorable manner until he's done something that makes him blameworthy. So if you don't consider me, brother, that's okay. You can attack me. But if you, I'm, I'm saying you generally, I'm not saying anyone does. But if you think that this man is a brother in the Lord, I disagree with him, but I'm not going to vilify him in order to make him look as evil as possible in order for you not to get to hear what he has to say because that's truly of the devil. That's what the devil does. Someone who's a believer and uh, someone else that you recognize as a believer, you hear him out. That's why I kept telling the brothers, listen more than you speak because let me make my point. Let me finish. Before I finish, listen. See, when I want to hear another position, I listen. I don't, I start, listen. And I hear, I process it, then I have questions. Okay, well, hold on, you said this. Well, what about this? But if I don't think he's a brother, I'm going for the juggler. If you're a Muslim or Jehovah's Witness, I'm not asking you to learn. I'm asking to decimate you. Because you're a false agent, a tool of the devil. But if you're a Christian, I'll hear you out. Go ahead, brother. Okay. Yeah? All right. That's, that's my policy. That is my policy. If I consider you a Christian, I'll hear you out. If I think you're a tool of the devil, I will decimate you because it's not me now. I'm now worried about the flock. You're a wolf and you're sent by the devil to devour the flock. And if I'm a mature Christian, and I hope I am, it's my duty to love my brethren to protect them from you. See, that's a different attitude, right? But now with that said, someone read that passage. You're smiling at me because I consider you a brother, huh? Which verse? First Corinthians. Yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> no, it's Say again? Oh, yeah, it was Colossians chapter 1. I like the way you laid that out. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, what, because that's what it is. What yeah. verse? Colossians 1. Now, you guys, if, you're, if you have stones, please put them in, the, in your trunk. So give me at least five minutes to run, because I'm going to leave the state. Okay, Colossians 1. This is what, when Matt Slick, who's my brother in the Lord, he did something that I thought he shouldn't have done. He tried to vilify me, and it didn't work, though. You can listen to the debate. He tried to vilify me, and I said, Matt, you're misrepresenting me, guy. Listen to what I'm saying carefully. And this is a passage that's a nightmare for those who believe in limited atonement. If you believe Christ only died for the elect, this is your nightmare passage. 
This is what messed me up. One of many, this one was the chief one. This one, I would keep reading over it and reading over it, and I wrestled because I was convinced the five points of Calvinism must be biblical, and any passage that doesn't agree, I'm misinterpreting it. See, it wasn't maybe the system is wrong. No, it's the explanation of this verse that's wrong because the system is airtight. But then the Lord released me. That's why I don't subscribe to a system. I'll let the Bible speak. And if something that you believe doesn't agree, I'll say, brother, okay, you believe that? God bless you. I, I can't accept it. I can't accept it. You want to accept that's okay. I can't accept it. I may be wrong. I may not be able to see what you're seeing. Pray for me to get to that point. But if you're wrong, may the Lord show you. Right? I mean, if you think you're right, obviously you don't believe something because you think you're wrong. But you may be wrong and not know it. So this is why I began the session. I'm going to emphasize like a broken record. Seek the Holy Spirit. Please show me where I am wrong. Please guide me and break my pride if I'm not willing to give up. Because that's what I did. I came kicking and screaming. I did not want to give up on Calvinism. No, no. And the Holy Spirit said, yes, yes. And who do you think is stronger, me or the Holy Spirit? And he brought me to my knees. But go to Colossians 1. Let's read 13 to 17. Now get ready. If you do believe in limited atonement, get ready. And if you believe that Christ died for everyone, get ready to be troubled. Get ready to be troubled. I'm letting you know. So if you're troubled, I told you, right? So don't get upset at me. Colossians 1, 13 to 17. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth. Pause for a second, my brother. Would anyone deny when it says, by Christ, all things were created in heaven and earth? That means every creature? Everything. Now, if you want to go the route of Joe Witness and insert the word other, that's what they do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In their translation, all other things. Yeah. They can't have Jesus creating everything in heaven and earth. So now, get, I'm smiling because I know where this is going to go. Oh boy. Everything in heaven, that means angels, Satan, and it, it goes on. Dominions, and right? Clear, right? All right. Keep reading. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things hold together okay, now clear as day all things in heaven and earth means the entire creation no one is excluded right even spiritual powers because it has dominions principalities authorities right all right if you if it's clear as day now read 18 and 20 and notice the second half of what many believe is a hymn actually if you read commentaries, they'll tell you they think that Paul is actually citing an early Christian hymn. That it's a hymn that Paul incorporated by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's what some believe. We don't know for sure, but that's a belief. There are several statements in Paul that people think are hymns of the church. This is one. The other is Philippians 2, 5 to 11. It's called Carmen Christi, a hymn to Christ, where it says, Who being in very nature God, do not consider equality God something to exploit, but made himself nothing by taking on the form of a slave, etc. Some think that's also a hymn that Paul incorporated. Whether it's a hymn or not, still it reflects what Paul and the church has believed. Right? Now notice the second part, 18 to 20. And he is the head uh, of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead. That is, in everything he might be preeminent. Okay. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the oh. blood of the cross. Uh-oh. Did the light switch go on for anyone? Verse 20. Jesus made peace by the blood of the cross for who? All things. All things. All things. All things where? In heaven and earth. And where? On earth and where? But that's parallel to 16, right? All things that he created in heaven and earth, he's now procured the redemption of everything he created in heaven and earth. That's parallel. I know it's not true, but there's some people out there professing to be Christians 
that take this scripture universalism huh? and say yeah. because of what he did he died yeah. for everybody therefore everybody will be in heaven now just two comments I would say number one I know it's not true yeah well number one I'm not a universalist but remember you're already adamant it can't be true and you even question their Christianity could they be wrong and still be Christians because the way you, you, you stated it, I don't, I don't know. I don't yeah, but the way you stated it, they profess to be Christian, meaning you don't think they are. I think their theology puts some questions out if, there. If perfect theology is a prerequisite, you yeah, and me will be trust in hell. <laughs> we're all going to hell. I agree. We can be gracious and say, you're wrong, but you're a brother in Christ, because this is not one of those doctrines that will damn you. Right? I mean, I don't think... Your view of the afterlife, whether hell is forever, or it's a short period of time, and then it's remedial, God will then cure you or wipe you out. We can disagree without assuming that the person who disagrees with me, he's the one going to hell. Maybe they're right, you're going to end up in hell. Right? right? And it's a possibility. Sure. But just like you'd want him to hope that you're going to heaven, wish that for him. Right. Mm -hmm. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Right. Yeah. Wish that unto him. Lord, if he's wrong, I'm right, have mercy on him. If I'm wrong, he's right, have mercy on me. See, there are some issues worth fighting over. I don't think these are one of them that I would go to blows with. Now, if you tell me Jesus isn't God, give me a stone and give me a baseball bat. <laughs> I understand where you're going. Where does repentance, if universalism is where a person's theology is, yes. then there's really no need for repentance. Well, they're saying and those... For that matter, yeah, obedience. Yeah, that's not their position. Their position is if you've died rejecting Christ, that's why you will go to hell. Because that's where you will be punished for your repentance. But the purpose is not to wipe you out or to prolong your judgment. It's to purge you and purify you of your evil so that now you enter heaven and are grateful for what Jesus did. So they say that's what hell is there for, for the person who refused to turn to Christ. Right? So again, I'm not making a case for universalism. I'm not a universalist. But what I'm saying is, the first to present his case seems right until and his neighbor comes and questions him. You've heard criticisms of their view, but have you ever sat and listened to someone make a case for their view and then decided whether they're wrong? Right. You see the point? Yes. Let me give you another verse that goes with this. And don't lose your place in Colossians. Keep it there, because we didn't finish Colossians. Got it. Go to Proverbs 18:13. See, with me, if someone's a Trinitarian who loves and worships the Triton God and believes Jesus is the God-man, that he's born of the Virgin Mary, he died physically for our sins, was raised physically, will return physically and bodily, and believes the Bible is God's perfect word, that is enough for me to consider you my brother and sister in Christ. Everything else we can agree to disagree and fight over, right? That's me, just me. I'm not God. God could say I could care less for your opinion. Well, that's just me. If you're an anti-Trinitarian, no, no, we're going to debate until you repent. That's not going to happen. No, no. Jesus is no created Archangel Michael. That Jesus can't save anyone. But Proverbs 18.13 is another passage we need to put take to heart. Someone read that for me. He that answereth an a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. So when you rush to judgment to answer before hearing it out thoroughly, what did the text say? You're being, and I'm not saying you, you. You're being right. stupid and foolish. Fool and sure. Right? So you see, this is wisdom from God. Don't rush to judge. Don't speak before you've heard something thoroughly. And don't settle for the first opinion, because the first to present his case seems right until his neighbor comes and questions him. That was the same chapter, verse 17. So by now, coming back to Colossians 1. Let's go back to Colossians 1. Now, let's read 16 and 17 again. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold. Now read verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
So if in verse 16, all things in heaven and earth means the entire creation without exception. So did Jesus create everything in heaven and on earth without exception? Correct. Mm -hmm. But then how do you then avoid the implication of verse 20? He also procured the redemption of all things on earth and in heaven. Who's exempted from the work of his redemption? Nobody? Well, those are rejected. Yes, but not, not talking about its application. Okay, all right. Redemption accomplished is not the same thing as redemption applied. Right. You know what I'm saying? When he accomplished redemption, who did he accomplish it for? Everybody. Everyone, right? Yes. So then how can limited atonement be true? That he only died for the elect. Good point. Right? Now, how did I get vilified in the debate to make me look bad? Let me tell you. You can watch the debate. Oh, so you're saying he died for Satan. I said, Matt, mm -hmm. number one, if it means everything, it means everything. So if it means Satan, yes, but Satan will not be saved because he won't believe, because there's a condition. You must believe to receive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you see, he poisoned the well to make my position look so blasphemous so people wouldn't hear me out when I was just being exegetical. Mm -hmm. I said, just read it. I go, explain to me who the everyone. He couldn't do it. Go listen. He couldn't do it. So he resorted to what I call, and he, I'm not saying he did it deliberately. He's a brother in the Lord, but he's so passionate about this tradition, he ended up vilifying me out of emotional response. He did, and I'm, I don't hold it against him. I understand when you are invested emotionally, it's very hard to let something go. So he, the Calvinists had a field day. Oh, Sam Shimon says Satan's going to be saved. That's what they said. And that's not what I said. I said, Matt, the text exegetically, if all things in heaven and earth... You have no problem admitting Jesus created it. Then deal with the parallel. All things on earth and in heaven, he has redeemed and made peace with the blood of his cross. So then Satan will be saved. No, because accomplishing redemption is not the same thing as applying it because there's a condition you must believe to receive. He made it available to all. You got it. But the Calvinist doesn't like that. No, Jesus actually saves. He didn't make salvation a possibility. Well, that's fine and dandy. That preaches well. Give me exegesis. Mm -hmm. Deal with the text. It's right there. I didn't write Colossians. See, this is, my, this is the problem I was having as a Calvinist. I had to explain away a lot of passages. So quite clearly to answer the sister's question, there is no doubt that everyone that God created, He desires their salvation. Mm -hmm. No doubt about it. Now, how does predestination work? That's a topic that would require me. I can go into it, but it requires more than a two-minute soundbite, right? Because then you have to talk about what is actually being predestined, who is being predestined, and what's the relationship with free will, human responsibility. And in Christianity, you have various attempts of harmonizing it. It's not just the Calvinist understanding. God has predestined everything. If you actually force a Calvinist against the corner and say, do you acknowledge God predestined even the rape of a child? They have to say yes. They will tell you yes, because God has a purpose. Now, if it's biblical, hey, live with it. See, if it's something biblical, and I can't, okay, man, you know what? As hard as that pill is to swallow, the Bible says it, I have to trust God, because his thoughts are not mine. But a consistent Calvinist will tell you, yes, even the raping of that child was predestined. Otherwise, it could not happen. But now let me tell you what they're going to say. But God didn't force the rapist to rape the child. The rapist freely raped the child out of his own sinful inclination. Fine. Could he have chosen otherwise? No, if it's predestined. That's what they'll tell you. No. If it's predestined, he had to rape. But did God force? No. He did it out of his own free will, meaning his sin, because they do believe in free will. The freedom to act consistently with your nature. So you have the freedom to act in accord with your nature. But your nature is such you can't act contrary to it. For example, I want to fly like Superman. If I go to a high, high building and I go up, up, and away, splat, because my very nature does not allow me to fly. So yes, you have the freedom, the free will, to operate within the limitations of your nature. So when Judas, let's say, betrayed Jesus, he did it freely because as a sinner, his sinful heart desired to betray Jesus and God didn't compel him. But could have Judas chosen otherwise? No, he couldn't. 
And could God have stopped Judas? Yes, he could. Because in the Bible, you find God stopping people from carrying out specific sins. I'll give you one example. Abimelech, the king of Gerar. Abimelech, the king of Gerar. Abraham was too afraid to say, Sarah is my wife. So she, she said, she's my sister. And by the way, she was his sister. Did you guys know that? She was his sister. You guys looking at me like you're angry. Please forgive me. But you guys know that? Sarah was his sister. He says it. You know where he says it? If you go to Genesis 20, 12, he says, she is my sister. She's the daughter of my father. Mm -hmm. Different mother. Yeah, she is my sister. <laughs> Same dad, different mom. I didn't lie to you. So technically, I was speaking the truth. She's my wife. Yeah. Right? Genesis 20, verse 12. We got the same daddy, not the same mommy. So I didn't lie to you. Yeah, but you forgot the extra detail. She's not just your sister. She's your wife. Oops. But then just to tell you, he, and here's a man called the father of the faithful, how cowardly he was. And that same Genesis 20, if you read verse 13, he says, I made a covenant with her. If I find favor in your sight, don't tell people you're my wife because you're beautiful and they'll kill me. Tell them you're my sister. She agreed to it. I don't know if that sunk in, ladies. Sarai, who later became Sarah, was willing to be violated by men to save her husband's life. And her husband was willing to allow his wife to be ravished to protect his wife, to protect his life. Who showed greater faith and love there? Sarah or Abraham? Sarah. Sarah. I love you so much, I'm willing to be ravished by another man to spare your life, but you don't love me enough to fight for me and die for me. Mm. How many women would stick around with a man like that today? Right? And she did. So we often forget the faithfulness of Sarah. Why God loved her. See, it moves me sometimes. Some of these stories move me in my spirit. Why God loved her and said, she will be the mother of the child of the covenant. Because she's a great woman, Abraham. It's amazing. God is good. Anyway, when Abimelech took uh, Sarah, and right before he sleeps with her, he has a dream. It's Genesis 20, I'm not making up verses 1 to 6. You're as good as a dead man. You're as good as a dead man. Because you've taken another man's wife. And he said, will you punish my people and my innocence? Did he not tell me this is his wife? He goes, I know. This is why I kept you from sinning against me. This is why I kept you from sinning against me. So God stopped him. What's the point? Calvinist who's consistent has to say, yes, Judas' betrayal, that rape was predestined. God didn't make the person do it, but God did predestine it so that even though the person did it freely, he couldn't have, he couldn't have chosen contrarily. So that's one view of reconciling God's knowledge and human responsibility. There's another view. It's called middle knowledge, Molinism. One of its greatest defenders is William Lane Craig. Yeah. One of his greatest. Middle knowledge, basically, and Alex will correct me here if I'm, if I'm mistaken. God knows all possible universes. Yeah. He knows how every person will react in a given universe. So if I put you in situation A, this is how you react. If I put you in situation B, this is how you react. So God knew that this world is the only possible world where he could get the maximum number of people to be saved freely because of the circumstances that this universe would, would we'd, we'd uh, find ourselves in. I'm trying to articulate it clearly. So this view says God knows all things and he knows that if I want the most number of people to be saved, this is the only world I can create. Because there is no possible world will everyone freely believe. So the only world I can create where I can get the most number of people to freely be saved is this one. And that's why God created it. So that's another view. But there's a third view that many people don't like. It's called open theism. The champion of this view's name is Gregory Boyd. This view says God is infinitely wise, infinitely intelligent, and knows every possible choice anyone can make given the situation he or she finds himself or herself in. But the future does not exist. There is no future. It doesn't exist. So when this open theist will ask you the question, when you say God knows the future, how? It doesn't exist. So either he created it, but if you say he created it, that means he also created everything that will take place in the future, so you end up being a Calvinist. Right? So how do you escape that the future 
and the future decisions of free will creatures are not determined by God. If you say, he knows the future because he created it. That means if he created the future, he created everyone in it and what they'll do, you're now a Calvinist. Fore so, foreknowledge does not make you... What does foreknowledge mean? Now I'm just telling you how I'm playing angelic advocate. <laughs> what does uh, foreknowledge mean? It means you're God. Okay, well what does it mean for God to have foreknowledge? He has something before it happens. He has time and space means he, he, he can go anywhere, which direction he wants. A time that doesn't exist or that he created it? It hasn't existed yet. Okay, so then what's, them, what's, what's there for him to foreknow when it doesn't exist? I'll, when I get there, I'll let you Exactly know. the point. That's a very good answer as well. Mm -hmm. You can say, I don't know how God knows it, but that's my response. And there's no shame in saying that. You know why? Let me tell you why. The, what your answer was very biblical and respectful. Because there are things about God we won't know. Right. So you can tell some legitimacy. I don't know how he knows the future. He knows it without having to create it and everything in it. Right. How? I don't know, and I'm good with that answer. Because the Bible says, God's ways are not my ways, His thoughts are not my thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so is God's ways and thoughts. So I may not know, but it doesn't mean you're right. Yeah. Excellent answer.